The following is a paid presentation brought to you by Amazing Facts Incorporated. Coming up next on Amazing Facts Presents... Those who chose to worship Jehovah, they didn't pick their own new Sabbath day. They kept the Sabbath day that God picked. The one He gave Adam and Eve, the one He gave in the Ten Commandments, the one that Jesus kept, it's always been the same. For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Today's presentation is an excerpt from the Most Amazing Prophecies video series. All over the world, we have a seven-day week. What in the sun or moon or stars, what in astronomy would give us a seven-day week? There is nothing. The only place our world that all recognizes a seven-day week can trace it to is Genesis chapter 1. And yet what's interesting is even when many of the settlers came across the Atlantic and began to meet the native groups in North America, had a seven-day week. Where does it come from? Now, I think you'll find it very interesting how this ties into prophecy. Revelation chapter 13, you all know that chapter. That's the one that talks about the mark of the beast, the number 666. It tells us there, he was granted power, this is the beast power, to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Now, this is the second beast telling those who do not worship the first beast that if they don't worship the way they're told, they'll be killed. You can't hardly read Revelation 13 if you know your Bible without seeing shadows and echoes of Daniel chapter 3. Now, you remember when we studied Daniel chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar had that dream of the metallic image and uh, what was he told about the head of gold? Daniel said, you, meaning Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, you are the head of gold. And that really flattered his ego. But it troubled him as the prophecy continued because Daniel said, but after you, another kingdom shall arise inferior to yours. He didn't want there to be another kingdom. He wanted Babylon to last forever. It was inscribed on virtually every brick in ancient Babylon. He'd worked so hard to build it up, he didn't want to see it fall into someone else's hands or be replaced. And that troubled him. So, many scholars surmise that Nebuchadnezzar thought to himself, if that head of gold represents Babylon, what if I make an image, a great image, like the one I saw in my dream, except make it all gold? Maybe I can somehow change the prophecy of the gods and, and frustrate that prophecy so that Babylon will last forever. So Nebuchadnezzar did that. You can read this in the prophecy there of Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width was 6 cubits, and he set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now, before I go any farther, a Bible teacher from this campus years ago taught me something. He said, in Hebrew, if it tells you the height and the width, if it doesn't tell you the depth, it's usually the same as the width, meaning that image that Nebuchadnezzar built was 60 by 6 by 6. That sound familiar? And they're all told to bow down to that image or be killed. Does that sound like revelation to you? He's saying worship the way I tell you to worship or die. And he goes on and he made a decree, Daniel chapter 3, verse 6, whoever doesn't fall down and worship the same hour shall be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Well, there was one little problem. Among the great uh, leaders of his empire that he invited to the inauguration of this new image and this worship were three very loyal Hebrews. You remember Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, sometimes known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Those were their Babylonian names. When the music played and they were told they were supposed to bow down, they did not bow down. Why? 
because one of the Ten Commandments says, you shall not make unto you any graven images. You shall not bow down yourself to them nor serve them. It was one of the Ten Commandments. And they said, no. Oh, but their friends probably elbowed them. We know that you're Jews and you normally would not do this, but just once or you'll die. God will understand just once. Tie your shoe. Just when the music plays and everyone bows down, oh, look, my sandals. And just, you know, just don't cause a fuss. <laughs> what did they do? They said, we're not even going to look like we're bowing down. We're not going to give the devil this victory. We're standing up. Daniel chapter 3, verse 18. They're brought before Nebuchadnezzar, and he says, look, maybe you didn't hear the music. They said, Nebuchadnezzar, we're not going to worship your image. And they went on to say, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods. We just obey our God, nor worship the golden image which you have set up. We're just not going to do it. Don't, we don't need a second and a third chance. They were decisive about what they believed. Then it says, Nebuchadnezzar, in a rage, they ruined his inaugural party. These men were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. It was so hot, the soldiers who threw them in were slain by the heat of it. And Nebuchadnezzar said, didn't we throw three men bound into the midst of the fire? I see four men, not bound anymore, loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. When they went through the trial for their faith, who went through it with them? You will be tried for your obedience, but you will not be alone. We will be tested if we decide to follow Christ. This story ought to give us courage in the last days. And if that's not enough for you, go to Daniel chapter 6. Very similar. King Darius makes a law that everybody should worship a certain way for 30 days or go to the lion's den. And Daniel says, I'm not going to hide my devotions to God. He opens his window, prays out loud. He goes to the lion's den. He says, I'm going to obey God rather than man. I'm going to obey God rather than government. Daniel goes to the lion's den. Does God protect him? Yes, yes he does. Will we be faced with a similar test in the last days, choosing whether to obey the commandments of God or the commandments of the beast? And it had to do with worship. It all had to do with worship. Look with me, prophecy of Revelation chapter 14, one of the great prophecies in the Bible. I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them. This is verse 6, that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And say that word with me, worship him that made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the fountains of water. Here it is calling us to worship the Creator. Why does God deserve our worship? Because He is the Maker and we are the Makey. He is the Creator, we are the creation. Now, God has something in His law that talks to us about worship. Are you aware of that? It's one of His commandments. It's the longest of the Ten Commandments. It's in the middle of His law. And the amazing thing about this presentation is the truth about this subject is so clear and irrefutable that it, it is absolutely astonishing that this hoax has been perpetrated on so many dear people. It's the subject of the Sabbath truth because the whole Sabbath commandment revolves around worship. You notice there in Revelation 14, it said, worship him that made the heavens and the earth and the sea. That's drawn from Exodus 20, the fourth commandment about the Sabbath. Haven't we been learning that Revelation, there are shadows in Revelation. It's a kaleidoscope of all these other passages in the Bible. It's all about worship. Very beginning of the Bible, Adam and Eve have two boys, Cain and Abel. They both build altars ostensibly to the same God. One worships the way God said, Abel. Cain does it his own way. He gets upset because God accepts Abel, but he doesn't accept Cain's man-made worship. Cain kills Abel. Fast forward to the end of the Bible. Two groups again, both worshiping, claiming to worship the same God. One is really worshiping the beast. The one who worships the beast is trying to kill the one who worships God. The devil wants our worship. God wants our worship. We must choose. That's one thing the devil cannot force you to do, and God will not force you. Now, as we talk about this subject of the Sabbath, the reason we're presenting this is because in the last days there is a movement to get back to the teachings of the Bible. Amen? Amen? And so, what is a Christian? 
follower of Christ. Let's find out what Jesus did. Question number one. On what day did Jesus customarily worship? The Bible tells us right there in Luke chapter 4, verse 16. And he, Jesus, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. What's a custom? Something you do once or twice or it's a habit, it's a pattern. His custom was to go to church, the synagogue is the church, on the Sabbath, worship God, read the Bible. It was a custom for him. You say, well, I have no problem with that, Pastor Doug, but what day is the Bible Sabbath? What day of the week is the Sabbath? Go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 2. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Now, it jumps out at me that the first time anything is mentioned three times in the Bible, it's the Sabbath. God is the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and that's why the angels say, holy, holy, holy. And here in Genesis, it says the seventh day, the seventh day, the seventh day. Now, what day of the week is the Sabbath day? If you go to any normal dictionary, you'll find that it says, Saturday is the seventh day of the week. The encyclopedia will tell you that. Matter of fact, in over 105 languages of the world, the word, no matter what the religion of the country is, the word for Saturday is Sabbath day. Um, some friends here speak Spanish, I know. This is being translated into Spanish. The word for Saturday is Sabado. We have any Russian friends here? Speak Russian? Seventh day is Subota. Even in Arabic, where they keep Friday as their Sabbath, the word for Saturday is Sabbath day. 105 languages of the world. It's got an interesting history. But Pastor Doug, hasn't the calendar been changed so we don't really know? Calendar's been changed many times. That's one of the famous myths that you hear. Oh, can't tell what day's the Sabbath. <laughs> People never have a problem with what day of the week it is until they hear the Sabbath truth. Fact is, if you don't know what day the Sabbath is, you don't know what day Sunday is either, right? But uh, you can know. No change to the calendar ever affects that. The Sabbath and the calendar, the weekly cycle, even though you see them on the same calendar on the wall, they're two completely independent measurements of time. No matter what you do to the calendar, it doesn't change the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's why your birthday is a different day of the week every year, right? Somebody wrote the U.S. Naval Observatory about this question, and this is a copy of the letter that came back, and they said, uh, We've had occasion to investigate the results of the works of specialists in chronology, and we have never found one of them that ever has the slightest doubt about the continuity of the weekly cycle since long before the Christian era. There has been no change in the calendar that has ever affected the continuity of the weekly cycle. Pope Gregory made a change back in, I think, 1582. Thursday, October 4th was followed by Friday, October 15th. They added 10 days. It changed the calendar. Did it change the week? No, it doesn't affect the week. So there's no question about what day of the week is the seventh day. And you know, for me, what the slam dunk is for me on this, you got a whole Jewish nation all over the world. Do they know what day the seventh day of the week is? It's always been what we commonly call Saturday today. There's more evidence for this later. Who made the Sabbath day and when? Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 and verse 3, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, and God blessed the seventh day. God did it way back in the beginning, in creation. That's why Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man back in the Garden of Eden. The Lord came walking in the cool of the day, looking for Adam and Eve. This day was a special day for their communion together. He created as a blessing to man. Was there sin in the world when God created the Sabbath? Was it part of his perfect plan? Then it's nothing that he needed to change. God in the very beginning made the institutions of marriage. Do we still have marriage? Is that still part of God's plan? By the way, um, what did God make for man in the Garden of Eden? He made woman and he made the Sabbath day. Do we still need women? Do we still need the Sabbath day? Part of his perfect plan. What does God say about Sabbath keeping in the Ten Commandments, which he wrote with his own finger, I might add? Exodus 20, verse 8, 
this is part, oh, by the way, it's not the 10 recommendations. They're not the 10 good ideas. It's the 10 commandments. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now notice, God on the Sabbath day, he rested, he blessed, and he sanctified the seventh day. One time the word holy appears in the Ten Commandments. It's in the middle of the law. It's the longest of the Ten Commandments. It's the one that begins with the word remember, and it's the Sabbath commandment, and yet it is one that is largely being neglected by professed Christians the world over. Does God care? He cared enough to speak it with his voice and write it with his finger in the presence of a whole nation. And Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Some people say, well, but the, that wasn't, they weren't really expected to keep the Sabbath as a Sabbath day until they got to Mount Sinai. Wrong, the Bible doesn't teach that. For instance, when the children of Israel first came out of Egypt, before they get to Mount Sinai, God rains manna down from heaven. You remember that experience? And Moses said, eat that today for uh, today is a Sabbath. They gathered twice as much on Friday. For today is a Sabbath unto the Lord. Today you shall not find it in the field. God worked a miracle the whole time they were in the wilderness where he rained manna down from heaven. Six days a week, they'd get twice as much on Friday and he would not rain manna on the Sabbath. Now, that's in Exodus chapter 16. And he's telling them that the Sabbath is his commandment. He uses that phrase in his law before they get to Mount Sinai. Yeah, the children of Israel had forgotten about it or it had been neglected. Pastor Doug, that's the Old Testament. Haven't the Ten Commandments been changed or altered in some way? You know, that's what prophecy tells us the beast would think to do. You remember we studied the Antichrist, Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. One of his characteristics was he would think to change times and laws. When I look at the Ten Commandments, I can only find one commandment that is both a law and a time. It's the Sabbath. Proverbs 30, verse 5 and 6. Every word of God is pure. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. We are not to add to or take away from his words. And then you can also read in Hebrews 4, 9. This is New Testament. There remains therefore a rest to the people of God. And that word rest there, if you take it from its Greek translation, is sabbatismos, and it means the keeping of a Sabbath. There remains, this is New Testament, one of the final books in the New Testament, says there remains the keeping of a Sabbath for the people of God. Oh, somebody's gonna say, well, Pastor Doug, now that we're Christians, we keep the spirit of the law, not the letter. You're being legalistic to, to tell people they got to keep the letter of the law. Remember we talked about that a little bit? How can you say you're going to keep the spirit of the law and ignore the letter? The letter is the foundation for the spirit. If you say, I'm going to keep the spirit of the law that says thou shalt not commit adultery, which means you don't look upon the opposite sex to think it in your heart. That's right. That's the spirit of it. But how do you keep the spirit of the law and say, I'm going to commit the act of adultery, but I'm not going to break the spirit? Or I'm not going to break the spirit of the law, thou shalt not kill. Jesus said, the law says don't kill, but I say unto you, whoever is angry with his brother without cause is guilty of murder. That's the spirit of the law. But if you're not going to break the spirit of the law, don't be angry with your brother without cause. How do you keep that and still break the letter? So if you're going to keep the spirit of the law, Jesus said, come unto me and I'll give you rest. That's the spirit of the law. I believe it. Amen. Amen. But the Sabbath is the very starting point for that experience of rest. And do we still need a day of rest? Yes. Do we need a day of worship? Yes. Corporate worship. Some people say, oh, Pastor Doug, I'm, I'm a New Testament Christian. I worship God seven days a week. You only worship him one day a week. And you know, the Bible tells us that we should, I believe, worship God always. But in the commandment, it says we are not to work. And if a person says that they're keeping the Sabbath seven days a week, they're not holy, they're lazy. <laughs> We're supposed to only keep that day one day a week, not secular work, but reserve that day only for holy time with God. Some are saying now that we're under grace, grace blots out the law. We're not under the law anymore. We're now under grace. You know, I don't get that either. That's sort of like you get pulled over by a policeman because you're driving too fast and you start to cry. It works. I've done it. <laughs> and she didn't give me a ticket. <clears throat> But suppose they do show you mercy. What do you do? Say, praise the Lord. I'm not under the law now because they've had mercy on me so I can drive as fast as I want. 
No, when you're forgiven because of being under the law and the curse of the law for our sins, when you're forgiven for your sins, Christians are the most careful to obey the law. We're not given a license to disobey. Did the apostles keep the Sabbath? Yes. Paul, as his manner was, he went unto them three Sabbath days and he reasoned with them out of the scriptures. And this is Acts 17, verse 2. You can jump to Acts 18, verse 4. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. Greeks meaning Gentiles, non-Jews. Why would you think that Jesus would say, speaking of the last days, pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Christ, looking down the course of time, seeing his people in the last days, told them we should pray that we wouldn't have to flee on the Sabbath day. If they're not keeping the Sabbath anymore, why would Jesus say that? Did the Gentiles also worship on the Sabbath day? New Testament, yes. Acts chapter 13, verse 42. By the way, this is written by a Gentile. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath day. That's still the seventh day of the week, not Sunday. And it goes on to say in Mark chapter 2, verse 27, and he said unto them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath is meant to be a blessing for mankind. Now, one of the big struggles Jesus had during his earthly ministry is the religious leaders at his time had become very legalistic about the Sabbath. Disciples are walking through the field. They're hungry. They pick some grain out of the field, and they're eating it. And the Pharisees said, you're harvesting on the Sabbath, and you're carrying a burden. I mean, they had all these man-made laws, and Christ did have to contend with that. But never, ever does Jesus say, Sabbath doesn't matter anymore. Matter of fact, it was so important to Christ and his disciples understood this that after he had died on the cross, they did not even finish embalming his body because the Sabbath had come. They waited until after the Sabbath and came back. Matter of fact, Christ said, think not that I have come to destroy the law. Don't think that. Isaiah chapter 56, is it also for the Gentiles? A prophecy in the Old Testament. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants. Everyone that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and taking hold of my covenant, he will make them joyful in his house of prayer. The sons of the stranger, those who chose to worship Jehovah, they didn't pick their own new Sabbath day. They kept the Sabbath day that God picked, the one he gave Adam and Eve, the one he gave in the Ten Commandments, the one that Jesus kept, it's always been the same. Do we still need physical rest? Oh, man, I tell you, we're living in a society today. There is a whole litany of diseases now that have been connected with stress and fatigue, ranging from heart disease, high blood pressure, ulcers. One of the top-selling medications in North America deals with ulcers, sleep aids. People are stressed and they don't sleep. A lot of it is because people have forgotten about God's time of rest. And he blessed the day. You know, it said right there in the commandment, I've sanctified it. I've blessed it. I've made it holy. God even rested that day and we're made in his image. If God rested that day, are we better than him? And so it is important to the Lord. It's important for our health. Was the Sabbath changed to Sunday at Christ's resurrection? How many of you heard that before? You don't find that anywhere in the Bible. Matter of fact, if we read in the Bible, Luke chapter 23, verse 54, I'll read all the way through Luke chapter 24, verse 1. And that day was the preparation, Friday, and the Sabbath drew on. The day Jesus died on the cross is commonly called Good Friday, okay? Now, before I get to the rest of Luke, I wanted to interject a couple of slides here. When does the Sabbath begin, just so you know? Jesus died right about sundown. It says in Leviticus 23, 32, from even unto even, even meaning evening, sundown, you shall celebrate your Sabbath. If that's not enough, read Mark 1, 32. And at even when the sun did set. So the Sabbath begins and ends at sunset. The Sabbath time, sacred hours, not just for Jews, but for all that follow the God of the Bible. You keep going back to, uh, or let's return back to Luke chapter 23. So, Friday, sundown, it says they returned and prepared spices and ointments and they rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. Now, this is the Gospel of Luke. Is Luke a Jew or a Gentile? 
What a good opportunity Luke missed to say they rested according to the Jewish Sabbath, the Jewish law. He doesn't. He says, the commandment. Why, as though there's no question about it. Stay tuned. Pastor Doug will be right back with this week's special free offer. God has something in His law that talks to us about worship. Do we need a day of worship? How can you say you're going to keep the spirit of the law and ignore the letter? The letter is the foundation for the spirit. The devil wants our worship. God wants our worship. We must choose. Journey back through time to the center of the universe. Discover how a perfect angel transformed into Satan, the arch-villain. The birth of evil, a rebellion in heaven, a mutiny that moved to earth. Behold the creation of a beautiful new planet and the first humans. Witness the temptation of evil. Discover God's amazing plan to save his children. This is a story that involves every life on Earth. Every life. The Cosmic Conflict. If God is good, if God is all-powerful, if God is love, then what went wrong? Available now on DVD. Hi, friends. I expect that some of you might find it shocking that most modern churches have totally discarded or distorted the fourth commandment, and they've replaced it with man-made traditions. But this just underscores the importance of knowing the rest of the story regarding God's holy day of rest. We'd love to send you a free gift that will help you in your studies. It's a study guide entitled, The Lost Day of History. And I think you'll be amazed as you dig deeper into the Word Please call the toll-free number on your screen and ask for offer number 113. Or if you prefer, you can simply write to us at Amazing Facts, offer number 113, P.O. Box 1058, Roseville, California, 95678. Well, that's all the time we have for this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Until we meet again, remember the encouraging promise of Jesus. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. This is your last chance to take advantage of this week's special free offer. There is no cost or obligation. Just call the toll-free number on your screen and be sure to note the offer number when you make your request. The preceding was a paid presentation brought to you by Amazing Facts Incorporated.